Welcome from New York. This is the peripheral endovascular webcast. Before we start a very exciting case, I would like to uh, remind everybody that we have the, the live symposium uh, here in New York, June 11 to 14, Tuesday uh, through Friday, and a fellows course on Saturday the 15th. And uh, uh, would, uh, anyone could uh, register at uh, cccsymposium.org. This is a symposium of coronary, structural, and endovascular cases. Obviously, there will be some lectures around, but the bulk of the symposium is a great interaction between faculty and attendees regarding the live cases performed in a high volume and high rate from our cath labs here at Mount Sinai. The symposium will be in, at the medical center at the, uh, at the main auditorium. And again, the website register cccsymposium.org. After this quick uh, introduction, let us go to uh, the, the main uh, uh, session of today, um, which uh, is obviously an endovascular peripheral case. Uh, in case you have uh, you have an interest to see our previous cases, uh, they're all archived, including today's case is going to be archived after the end of it at the. Uh, 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 at this website that you're viewing, uh, peripheralinterventions.org. Uh, and uh, before, uh, without any further delay, let's go over to the uh, cath lab room. Uh, we uh, welcome uh, Dr. Christian and Dr. Wiley and the rest of the staff who's going to present us an exciting case, a very exciting case today. I'm not going to even say the title of the case. PK, tell us the subject. Well, you know, I, I, thanks again, George, um, as always. And, um, and again, um, you know, just to build on what Dr. Dangus said, we really hope to see all of you at our symposium. Um, as Dr. Dangus knows, uh, it's, uh, it's actually a very exciting symposium and uh, very much case-oriented and kind of real-world cases and real-world uh, situations to deal with. And we've got a real world situation here, and I'm gonna have Doctor uh, introduce our team. Dr. Jose Wiley is our associate director, been with us for every one of our cases, uh, except one, right? You weren't here for one. And then uh, we have Dr. Buria, who's our, who's our endovascular fellow, uh, Ray, who's deploying our filter as we speak, um, and, uh, and Elizabeth and Ricky. Um, and again, uh, you know, so, but without further ado, I'm gonna have Dr. Wiley present our case, a really exciting case, and we're gonna talk a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today's case is a 42-year-old uh, uh, gentleman with a past history of a gunshot wound five years ago to the upper thigh. He underwent surgical repair at that time. He now presents with Fontaine Class Three claudication, which is uh, claudication occurring at rest, for which he underwent a uh, peripheral angiogram, revealing a, a very stenotic uh, superficial femoral artery with a uh, aneurysm right after that stenosis. The plan for today is intervening on the uh, superficial femoral artery. So, so here, uh, so as you see, this is a very interesting case because I think it brings up a lot of issues that we've done here. Fortunately, some of which we're, which we're not gonna be able to show because of technical issues uh, with, with our software system, but I'm, I'm gonna have, um, I'm gonna at least uh, discuss what, what we've done as far as the workup of the patient. So this is a patient of, of one of our close friends and, and, and colleagues in the cat lab. Uh, who he saw as an outpatient clinic who presented with claudication progressive uh, since uh, I guess a few years after the, wo the gunshot wound and the repair. And then, and then basically has had uh, you know, uh, progression of his claudication, intermittent claudication to, base, uh, to rest pain with, with less, than, less than a block um, yeah, or 200 feet. Uh, so, 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 the, so the point here has become is how can we help this man with lifestyle limiting claudication? He was brought in uh, by our colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Bander, for, a, for an angiogram for other purposes for the heart, and during the, during the actual picture of the leg was when we noticed this, uh, this, this lesion, which we'll talk about. So, so before I get to how we worked it up, I just want to go over the angiographic findings as they're deploying our filter, um, and uh, we'll, we'll get to, just send this for me? Just send this? Okay. Perfect. So I'm, um, can you, can you put, put up the, uh, the film, guys, here? So I'm going to go. Oops. What's going on here? So this is an unusual case. Let me just take a moment to say to our viewers that they, um, 
they, uh, they are able to uh, ask a question by sending an email at the, from the same web page you are viewing us now. Uh, I'm sure there may be, um, there may be a few. And uh, I'm going to be reading those questions and addressing them uh, uh, to with the operators during the case. Carry on, PK. OK, George. So you can see here we got, we got left calm and femoral axis. I just want to go through our steps here. So what we did was we did an iliac angiogram. Uh, and I think, I think this is a very important picture because you can see that this is not an atherosclerotic process. You can see the patient has very, very clean iliac arteries without really any, any angiographic evidence. Obviously, everybody has uh, histopathologic evidence of atherosclerotic changes, but angiographic evidence, uh, at least overtly, of any atherosclerotic processes going on. So, so, so two things for the for the for everybody looking at this. You know, when when you look at when you look at an arch like this, you have to start thinking to yourself, well, how am I going to go get up and over? And as we know, and we've talked about this numerous times during our course over the last year plus a uh, couple of months, you know that the, the narrower the arch is the more difficult it is for us to get over. So here we have what's called as a universal flush catheter, and, and we wanted to get up and over. Now, Ray and I were doing this offline because we knew it would take a little bit of time. We actually gave ourselves extra time to get up and over. And you can see here what's happening is we, every time when we went up and over with a softer wire, whether for, first we were able to get the universal flush up to the level of the common femoral artery with a soft angle glide. Every time we tried with a stiff angle glide or any other wire, the UF catheter would, 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 be, would be pushed up into the into the into the uh, aorta and thereby we'd lose access so once we got the uf catheter into the soft in, into the common femoral uh, uh, region we then pushed our uh, soft angle glide down into the popliteal once we got into the popliteal this is the trick i want to teach you this uf catheter will not advance no matter what you try and if you try to put a stiff wire over this it will not advance it will actually torque you out again it will actually push you out so at this stage what we did was we walked out our uf catheter and we used a trailblazer or a, if you want to use a quick cross, that's fine. The reason why this works is this has a little bit of a braided uh, 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 body to it as compared to your UF catheter or any diagnostic catheter. So at this stage, your, 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 um, your trailblazer or your, your fine cross or your quick cross is again only going to get to the level of the common femoral or maybe just a little distal. So at this stage, because of that extra braiding that you have, you now take out your, your, um, your uh, soft soft angle glide wire and then slowly advance your stiff glide wire. The key here, and I do mean this, the key here is straight, keep the system straight, and number two is advance the wire slowly. As you're advancing the wire slowly, you're going to meet resistance. If you push fast, you're going to kick the whole system out. You have to jimmy it, for the lack of a better word, and that's a new word for me because I'm not from uh, America, as most of you might have surmised. What, what, what happens is when you jimmy the wire, the actual wire will actually slip through that, 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 that curve, and then your secondary stiffness of that wire will then straighten out the iliac. Once we did that, I don't know if we sinned it. Let me see if we sinned it. We did not sinned it. But what, what happened was, as we took our sheath up and over, the sheath would not make that acute bend. And I want to show you the acute bend uh, from our iliac angiogram, OK? So now we had a stiff, we, we succeeded by having a stiff angle glide all the way down by the popliteal, OK? So our stiff angle glide is all the way at the level of the popliteal. And you can see you have this acute angle of the iliac, right? So it did straighten out to a certain degree, but not as wide as we'd like it. And we were afraid of putting an amplat super stiff, et cetera, et cetera. So at this stage, as our pinnacle cat got up to the left common iliac and tried to make the turn, it started to pull the wire. The reason is your sheath uh, dilator was too stiff. So at that stage, what you need to do is telescope the sheath over the dilator. And luckily, we have a smooth iliac. If we didn't have a smooth iliac, we'd never be able to get this done. You want to telescope it over the dilator and onto the contralateral. And as a matter of fact, Ray and I went down without a dilator, which is not something I recommend to anybody. But clearly, we had to get over that second hump in order to get down. Now, this case would never get done. You have no access for any grade. You may be able to come from a common uh, brachial approach, but we need to cut down because you need a large sheet size to get all the way down here to do what we have to do. And obviously this guy's already had surgical exploration and groin repair. So therefore this kind of case you clearly need to learn how to get access in a difficult, difficult anatomy. And not impossible, but definitely challenging. So, so once we got our seven French up and over, we went ahead and did, did our diagnostic cats as shots, and I want to show you uh, some of the challenges we faced, and then we went ahead and uh, did our diagnostic shots. Hold on a second. So here's our first diagnostic shot. 
So here you can see this, uh, the catheter is placed at the level of the common femoral artery. And at the level of the common femoral artery, we've, did, we've done a diagnostic picture, again revealing really clean vessels. You've got really no angiographic evidence of atherosclerosis that I can see or Dr. Wiley or Dr. Dengas can see. But clearly you can see here that you have a tight focal stenosis with a large collateral coming off it. And, 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 you've, and you've also seen that you basically have a, 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 a post-stenotic dilatation. Now uh, crossing this, I suppose, was uh, rather easy with all the various wires you just said? Well, you know, we were very careful with the glide wire, George, to cross it because we did not want to dissect, as you can imagine, but we, we were able to do it. And then the 014 wire naturally slipped through. So we went down, and then we, I wanted to show you this. Now, I wanted to say one thing. Angiographically, you really have no idea what this is. As we know, an angiogram is a luminogram. Aneurysms can be large, can be, uh, can be much larger than the angiogram because of a layered clot. As, as, and I'm sure you can talk about that with your experience with triple A's, George. But, but clearly here, you know, you, we know that angiographically you have a post dilatation that seems significant. But more importantly, you have an extremely, extremely tight stenosis that explains all of his claudication and, and his symptoms that he has. Number two, you can see that the artery is beyond the post dilatation, it's quite ectatic. So, so again, it's a very important point to note. And then as, as you go down further, the, 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 ar the artery starts to taper, okay, uh, past the post dilatation and the ectatic segment there, as you can see, and then starts to become what looks like more of a normal SFA size. And then as I, as I kept telling you earlier, it does not have any real evidence of atherosclerosis, and you basically have three vessels run off into the foot. So, so as far as the workup of this patient, I think we want to spend a little time on that, and then we're going to talk. Obviously, you know, in, in any major institution, you're going to have all the different uh, modalities available to you. And so what we decided to do was take advantage of certain things. And I don't want to talk to you about the importance of each one of those things that we do. We have Dr. Javier Sanz, who's our director of our CTMR program, the Cardiovascular Institute. And uh, Dr. Sanz was kind enough to come today, but unfortunately, we don't have the ability to interface our, our, um, our because of our, our, our software upgrade at this time. So I can't show you the CT images, but, but, uh, but I, I can tell you what we did and why we did it. So I asked Dr. Bander to get a CT angio. The reason why we wanted to get a CT angio was two. One was to, was to clearly um, uh, measure the aneurysm, okay, to, to, to look at what was the size of the aneurysm and, and whether or not uh, that there was any pseudoaneurysm component to it. Number two, whether there was any thrombus associated with the proximal to this aneurysm or whether there was any, anything like that that we needed to worry about. Three was to get proper measurements of, of, of the artery, both proximal and distal to this. And George, you can maybe build on this with your experience with AAAs and the use of CTs in aneurysmal segments. And, and, and four, to also make sure that we, don't, we haven't missed anything else. Maybe there was a reason why this happened. Maybe there's an important collateral coming off that Dr. Sands would identify, let us know, that angiographically we couldn't see. So we did that first. Number two, we've also, I believe Dr. Bander got an ultrasound, but I, I'm pretty certain he did. If he didn't, it would be important to, to get an ultrasound as well, because you'd want to document velocities, as well as pseudoaneurysm was also very well seen with velocities. Now, since this was traumatic, and it had undergone a surgical repair, and we didn't do it here, we we don't know exactly what, what, had been, what had been done, what type of the, uh, uh, consequences of that surgery had occurred. So, so once we did that, we, we went ahead and now we, we, we bought and we discussed it with our vascular surgery chief, Dr. Peter Ferries, who unfortunately couldn't be here. He, had a, he, had a, he has an important case going on at the same time down in, down in uh, his suite. So, so, so the issue became, as we discussed, about the options of surgical repair versus endovascular repair. And I think that's the, the entire process of what we're talking about. So, so uh, now, as far as endovascular repair is concerned, uh, actually, before I go to that, George, why don't you talk a little bit about the role of CT and aneurysm uh, as far as you're concerned in terms of uh, evaluating aneurysms? Yeah, that is a, it's a very, uh, very nice question. Um, the, uh, the CT is a very important tool in assessing the aneurysm because you, you want to understand what is the true diameter of the vessel. Right now we, we see, for example, and you can uh, actually go back to the picture of the aneurysm so we can uh, see that instead of the runoff while we're talking. Um, the, uh, uh, that the, the uh, SFA, I mean, the SFA is, um, has a super tight lesion uh, near the ostium. Can you back up the angiogram, please, to show the, uh, the culprit lesion? You got um, it. And, um, um, and there is a tight stenosis, and right after that, 
this is essentially a post anotic dilation versus maybe a, a true aneurysmal process related to perhaps uh, uh, excising this artery or trauma to, to this artery that had required repair already. So that's a little bit, uh, uh, that is a little bit unclear. Um, uh, so the vessel could be much larger than what the lumen is, even at its largest point, uh, because it may be layer of thrombus. It may also be that even where the lesion is, there may be quite a bit of thrombus, and you need to know those things. And um, obviously, in any patient with aneurysm, you want to have these very accurate measurements and these very accurate relations. Um, because you need to know if you're going to cover the aneurysm or if you're going to not cover the aneurysm uh, and uh, uh, just treat the, the stenosis before and how you would accomplish uh, those things. And obviously, if you're using a cover stand, those stands need to be of an accurate diameter because they're not expanding uh, indefinitely, uh, such as the, we, we may think of the, uh, some of the uh, regular stands and non-covered. Uh, when you're trying to place a cover stand, you have to have an accurate sizing as much as possible in order to match the, the seal zones, proximal and distal, uh, and because it's not so easy to just post-dilate it up um, because it may frequently, first of all, shorten, and secondly, it may not even dilate up to a, to a certain limit. There may be limits to its dilation. So for all these reasons, having as much information as possible uh, regarding the sizing and the contribution of thrombus versus vessel, the CT is needed. Just a quick word regarding the duplex. The duplex is mostly needed so you can follow. You need to document it now. They can have a picture before or soon after the intervention. You get another duplex. And then you follow up with this very easy non-invasive technique that doesn't have any radiation uh, exposure, the uh, duplex ultrasound. And for this purpose, we, we should also have uh, done this one uh, as, uh, as PK indicated. So George, that was actually uh, perfect. Thank you so much for that. The, the, the thing I want to talk to you about was in eventually Dr. Wiley and I plan all our cases prior to, you know, the, the, three, the three caveats that you need to know is, as, as an interventionist when you see something like this, is that number one, it can be surgically repaired, okay? Number two, it's a lifestyle issue. Yes, it's a bad lifestyle issue. And number three, so the, the taking those two things into consideration, you have to have a plan that's going to be feasible, quick, and, and effective, and, and not be able to make this patient worse. So what are the things that can make the patient worse? Okay, one is, you are like Dr. Dang has clearly, clearly told you, when, when you talk about planning a case, you want to have a, a, how are you going to handle this particular case? So when you have an aneurysm, you'd like to exclude the aneurysm. We all understand the concept of excluding the aneurysm. But in this region, there, there are certain inbuilt dangers in this particular area. Well, one is you have the profunda femoris artery at, at, that, at that area, okay? And two is you have the common femoral at that area. So, and three is, well, you have a post dilatation and anectasia. So, so how does that affect our decision making in this case? Well, we know that yes, this can be repeatedly surgically repaired and that's why we involved our surgeons. But the, but the point here is the CT angio, more, even more than our angio, gave us the ability to anatomically decide what we were gonna do. I measured the, uh, the, the distance between the common femoral and the aneurysm, the profonda and the aneurysm with Dr. Santa, which we could show to you. He was very kind to, to help us with that. And, and we, we have a good landing zone of over a centimeter uh, uh, at, at, that, at that point. Uh, oh, and the, the second thing is, we also measured the distal area where the SFA tapers. So, 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 so our CT measurements, forget the aneurysm measurement, which I'll have Ray scrub out and read to you, but, but the point is we have a seven millimeter proximal neck, okay? Right distal, the ectatic segment is from nine to 10 millimeters. Then distal to that at the distal SFA, it's seven millimeters. Okay, so now you, you, you know that yes, you have an ectatic segment, and then, and then you have a proximal, you, you know you're gonna achieve a proximal seal. The question is whether you're gonna achieve a distal seal or not. So, so the issue becomes is now you have to go back to your knowledge of your equipment. So when you go back to the knowledge of your equipment, you're gonna do an exclusion of this aneurysm and what is, what is available? Well, you have, a, you have a balloon expandable stunt called the atrium, right? And you have a self -expand, two self-expanding stunt. One is the, obviously the Viabon and the other is the, uh, the, the barred fluency. Now, we have a lot of experience with, with Viabons here and I know we all have different opinions, but I think the Viabon Bond here has been studied in the SFA, has been shown to have good good uh, results in the SFA, and I think it's a perfect case for a bi-bond because 
can also relatively accurately place it. Number two, so, so having said that, we, we, need, we need to now size that via bond, and that's where the CT comes in. So since the seven millimeter, we're probably going to go with either a seven or an eight. And, 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 then, and then what I wanted to do is a little bit above seven, is like 7.2, 7.3, which may not be so bad. And then, and then distally, we know that we're going to have to go at least 100 to 120 millimeters below. Now, live, while you're doing it, what you need to have is have live imaging to confirm what you're knowing from CT. And maybe I'm paranoid, but this is what I do. So, so, so what, what I want to do is make sure that I have double the imaging so I can have the help. And in the cath lab, as we know, we have IVIS uh, you know, to help us. So I've got a, gone ahead and done a, an IVIS here, and I'm going to have them pull up the IVIS, and, um, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play. Yep, I, I want you to go to run two. So, so, so run two, basically, you could see here that below the measurement was around nine point uh, about nine point six uh, millimeters, which uh, which which clearly clearly uh, correlates with our with our CT. Okay, because uh, Dr. Sands had measured it anywhere from between nine and ten. I remember there were certain areas it was a little bit bigger, in certain areas it was it was a little bit smaller. And as you can see, the the lumen is getting wider, and this is just distal to the actual aneurysmal segment. Okay, so, yeah, we're talking about the distal reference being around nine point five. Then, right, <laughs> just, just to be clear. No, but, distal reference. Right, right, George. But it is just this is just distal to the aneurysmal segment. Why is my eyes frozen, guys? Oh, you froze it? Okay. Now, a, as you see it coming forward, George, we're entering the aneurysm here, and you're going to see a lot of the swishing of the blood, and that's why we were a little concerned. We actually talked to Dr. Sands yesterday about clot, because in the report there was a, some question of clot or not, et cetera, et cetera, and Dr. Sands didn't feel there was any clot at that, at, at yesterday when we lo re looked at it. But, we're, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and you can see the aneurysm is building, and you can see the swishing of the blood, et cetera, et cetera. And as you come down towards the stenotic region, I want you to see the dissections that are present, the dual lumens that I see there, yep. and then this is the healthy proximal segment. Okay, and, Which and, and is you can what see references it. here? It, this was around seven millimeters, um, you know, uh, that uh, the, that he had that he had measured earlier with me. So, so clearly we we, we, we have this, uh, and he's saying actually it's around eight millimeters. Oh, seven point five eight. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, seven point okay. five or eight Very millimeters. Good. So, so and then and then we also uh, confirmed our, our landing zone to be perfect. Now, show me run one distally, please, distal to this one. So, what we did here, George, we went all the way to the healthy SFA, and we said, right. all right, let's go start from the healthy SFA. SFA and pull all the way back. So this is the healthy SFA, and as we're starting to pull back from the healthy SFA, or maybe maybe a little bit much above the adductor canal here, he's going to speed it up for us a little bit. You can see here, as it starts to get ectatic, it's really around seven to eight millimeters distal. So 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 you basically now, why is this important? This is important because when I need to size my stent, I need to decide on my sheet size. So if I have a seven millimeter uh, 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 stent, I can go with a seven French sheet. If I, if I have an eight millimeter stent uh, or a stent graft, I can go with an eight, a seven French sheet. If I need to go above nine or 10, then I have to go with a 10 or 11 or 12 millimeter sheet, which I can, uh, excuse me, 12 French sheet, which, which clearly is going to make this case impossible or more difficult to do percutaneously. And that becomes more of a surgical issue, and I think Dr. Wiley will agree. Dr. Wiley, any comments? I agree. You have to know your sheet size before you even begin planning this case. It would be easier to limit the sheet size to seven or at most eight French, I would say, given all the difficulties uh, you described before. Right, George, and I think, I think if you see the thought process going through, I think that's what's important. It may, may be a stenosis with balloon stented, but there's a lot more that go, goes on to this. Now, having said that, worry about that promise that we talked about, even though Dr. Sands felt yesterday there wasn't, we figured that there was a lot of, you know, swishing of blood, there's a lot of crud floating around there. We decided to put a filter down in the pop. We, the guy has three vessel runoff. We don't want it to get any worse. We don't want anything like that to happen because of this. Now, 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 can you show me the lesion itself, Greg? I want to show you the lesion itself, George. I know your, your, your expertise in IVIS is world renowned. Uh, I mean, my, my, my thing here is in terms of the lesion itself, it doesn't look anything that yeah. we should worry about in terms of very scary. Yeah, let me say a few things. The lesion is um, clearly irregular, clearly ulcerated, um, it's mostly fibro fibrotic. I did not see any many lucencies, and we can go back to the lesion if you don't mind. Right, he's going to play it right now. Yeah. I'm sorry about yeah. that. Right uh, there. So, right there. Uh, Actually, no, a little below that. Come across the aneurysm. A little bit. This is the aneurysm. And yep. by the way, the aneurysm is huge, and there's always a sluggish flow that you see the aneurysm. Right there. It's almost impossible to understand if there's a clot or not by Ivos. 
uh, not the greatest technique to uh, identify clot, I must say, the Ivus. Um, so I think we go by the CT and, uh, you know, uh, accept that the clot is not a lot, at least. There may be a small amount, but not a whole lot. Right. Um, but the... Uh, uh, but the aneurysm, but the lesion you can see now, and around 11 o'clock, you're going to see that there is a second lumen over right there. there. You see that yep, around yep, 10 and 11 yep. o'clock, there's I another do. circle. You can, you could have frozen a little bit there. Can you go back a little bit to the annual, to the to the lesion and uh, freeze it when I tell you? Right, right there. there, freeze it right there. Exactly. So you can see the where the arrow is is the main lumen, and they're measuring the main lumen now. And around uh, um, uh, uh, 10 or 11 o'clock, there's another. Uh, uh, loosened area and this is probably some miscommunications and around 1 to 2 o'clock there is another area um, uh, right there and, and the uh, and the um, and the big lumen and the big uh, vessel is all the way out the biggest circle which is a very big uh, very, very big lumen of the uh, very big vessel size i would say uh, one two three four five six seven eight so it's again an eight vessel there eight to nine vessel there um, so the lesion is really uh, you, uh, sort of a recanalization re of the uh, uh, recanalization of a uh, uh, occlusion or something similar, uh, and, um, and not just a constriction, not like a smooth constriction of the um, uh, of the uh, of the wall. So, so I think it's wise to just do a small dilation in order to be able to pass the the equipment. And I must say that the, it's a good idea to have put in the filter because you protect against even uh, a modest amount of clots and. Um, uh, the trade-off of that is that you no longer have a 035 wire, but with the uh, relatively straight lesion and a relatively straight, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, straight shot from your sheath, which is very close, uh, even the vibon will be able to, to go through. Right. I think the, the key points here is you do want to have complete expansion of this lesion prior to you putting your vibon in. Can I inject, please? So, so what we now, George, uh, can you let me inject? You got it. Right? So, what we want to do is we want to go ahead and pre-dilate this. And George, what I decided to go here is to be conservative here. I'm going to start with a five angioscope, okay? And the reason I'm going to start with the angioscope, like you said, it was irregular, it was a little fibrous. Yeah. I, I'm assuming that there may be some severe scarring to this. And I'm going to undersize my angioscope, even though Dr. Sands gave me the measurements of it being seven. So, what, what, what sheath you have first of all? You have a seven for a sheath or an eight? George, uh, like okay. I said, we planned it with a seven. We have a seven, okay. So we planned it with a seven, and honestly, we couldn't do any more than that, as I told yeah, you, exactly. because of the difficulties we had getting even a seven up and over. So and the maximum uh, Vibon stand graft size is an eight. Is right. that right? Well, that's, our, that's our goal. Exactly. So, so that that is what the intervention needs to know right. from equipment point of view. With the kind of sheet you were, they were able to place, and again, there were some limitations because it's very narrow aortic bifurcation uh, that... Um, uh, only a seven French is, and the maximum that fits there is the Vibon 8. So starting with a five is a very, very reasonable, um, uh, very, very reasonable um, uh, uh, size to start so pedalating. We're going to go slowly with a five angioscope. It may slide forward, so I'm going to hold a little bit of tension. I don't want it to come too far. Down, 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 so you can see. Oh, okay, you got it. You got it. I think you got no, it. No, you got it. You no, got it. Yeah, you can pull a little bit, yeah, but you got pull. it. We're at two. So there it is. There you go. Four atmospheres. You just go to eight. Eight is nominal. So there's our eight atmosphere angel sculpt there, right? Okay, down. Now we're not going to go crazy here. We just want to get this expanded, and we also want to ensure expansion uh, for to make sure that our vibe body expands. Do you see it right? So we're going to take, take a quick squirt here just to make sure everything looks reasonably good for us. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so I'm probably going to go with a 6. Give me a 6020. I want to go ahead and open this up as big as I can. And then uh, I, and probably go with a 7 all regular balloon after the 6020 angel skull. Uh, and then I'm going to go ahead with a 7 all And then finally probably, because that's going to be the size of uh, Viabond that I'm going to try to deploy. So give me a, a 6020 angel skull followed by a 7020 balloon. So, so, so the point here is that we would like to ensure the expansion of the bibon and not have any enfolding. We know that, that at the level of the aneurysm, the bibon is going to be undersized. We know for sure that the undersizing of the bibon there is to exclude the aneurysm outside and to collapse, uh, to, to, for, for it to collapse. However, so at this stage here, we need to ensure the expansion of the bibon at the level of the neck. 
So since we have a CT measurement anywhere from seven to eight, I think I, I approximately, which is our landing zone, it gives us the ability to be able to balloon aggressively with a seven, knowing that we're one to one proximally, or at least almost close to one to one proximally, and distally it doesn't matter because we're floating within the annular Exactly. So, right. so that's the whole logic, and the reason I'm using another angel sculpt here, honestly, is to ensure that I do not want to go to crazy high pressures with my non-compliant balloon, because we know it's an aneurysmal segment. We know that there's weakened arterial structures at that particular level, and we don't want to rupture this. So and, I uh, like to take a stepwise approach in doing this, and that's exactly what we're doing here, uh, George. Uh, PK, let's, uh, since it's going to be a little bit uh, repetitive uh, 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 angiosculpt uh, inflation, let's talk a little bit about pharmacology. Are you using angiomax in this patient? Actually, that's a great point. Uh, 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 you, know, you know, George, as you know, we use uh, 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 bivalrutin in our lab predominantly, and yes, even in this case, we're using bivalrutin. The risk of rupture here is, is, is real, because as I told you, we're dealing with an aneurysmal segment here, and, but we know we're working with covered stents, and our plan is to exclude this, give me a little die, guys. So, so, so we know that we're not gonna have to worry too much about uh, you know, the fact that, God forbid, we rupture or something like that. Go up here. So the second thing goes also, I want you to see angiographically, we have a nice landing zone here too, so we can actually set this up on the fluorophane and then, and then have a nice angiographic landing zone for him. So here, we're gonna go up with our 6L and then our 7 and I apologize for the repetitiveness. Up, down, down. There you go, excellent. No, actually, so in, uh, in addition to the uh, bavalirudin, you also have the patient uh, start a, a aspirin and clopidogrel a few, a few days before, or you no, know them no, today, or what's that story? Uh, uh, Actually, yeah, we posed him on the table. Uh, Dr. Banner didn't have any any uh, reason for him to be on clopidogrel other than this. And probably, you're right, in, 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 in proper planning of the procedure, I should have put him on clopidogrel proximal too. So it expanded well to eight. And, but at the same time, as we know, by the time we do our case and, and our, um, our Andrew Max wears off, I think he should be pretty good with the antiplatelet agent. George, just a few comments about coverage stenting. Now, I, I think there are certain principles that, that we need to talk about with coverage stenting. Dr. Wiley and I have always taught our fellows here that you know, as far as, you know, not yet, as far as coverage stenting is concerned, good, is, is that we, need, we believe in runoff. The greater your runoff, the, 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 the better your patencies with coverage stenting, and, 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 and also the, the, the reduction uh, the reduction of the risk of your acute thrombosis of a covered stent. So here's a young man, obviously, who's got this problem, who's been surgically fixed once, and now has, has had this problem. I want to make sure that I had good runoff, and I think that's where also the CT also helps us to do this. I would ideally like to limit the length of my covered stent, as you know we all would, but I think in this particular case, it's, it's, it's going to force our hand to place a larger covered stent than we need to. A uh, little dive here, guys. The other option here, if, if you're, okay, I'll go up there. The other option here is if you're a little worried about placing such a large coverage stand, what you could do is place a shorter coverage stand, see if you get a seal. And if you get a seal, then just leave it. And then if you, if you need to extend it as another limb, then go ahead and extend it. Go slowly. Six. Oh, okay. see, we had a, okay, had a little bit of a, had a little bit of a neck there, as you see, yeah, and we took it over. We'll die, guys. So let's see what happened here. So, okay, we we made it big. Yeah. We Good. definitely yeah. opened it up here. Well, I think that was a critical part because it's better to do this, uh, take this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, We're going to have to go up one more time, George, because I really don't. You're going to feel it one more time, Anthony. Breathe out for me. Go slow. So you can see here that he's got the neck. Slow, slow. Breathe out, Anthony. Breathe. Uh, in through your mouth, out through your, uh, out through your mouth. Slowly, buddy. Go to nominal. We're at eight. We're at eight. So this is pretty much nominal. Breathe out, Nar. Breathe out, buddy. Down. So you can see here that, that that's the critical mass, and when a patient starts to feel pain, you know you're pretty much one-to-one -one with your balloon or a little bit over. Yep. So we've also got the ability to now say that, hey, the seven millimeter size is pretty good here. Walk this out. So, so, take that out here, make sure we have yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Wiley's given us a great point here where that we know that when a patient experiences pain, you can have perf. So, and luckily we don't have a perf, right? So I think that's a very good point that Dr. Wiley brings up, you know, in terms of safety. If God forbid you have perf at that level, then you might as well now have a balloon there, put up a balloon there, and then you're done. So now at this stage, we know we haven't perf, we know we've expanded, because now you can see how good it looks, and you saw our serial, not, uh, the way we expanded, to make sure that, 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 that we don't perf. Now you can imagine if I had just gone up with just a seven millimeter balloon here, and then, and then gone ahead and, and, uh, and expanded it 
uh, under eight atmospheres without actually scoring it or cutting it or doing some sort of modification to that plaque. At that stage, clearly, you might have perfed because what would happen is you would have uneven expansion of the lesion with, with a certain give in the, so a weaker area of the lesion versus no give in the tighter area of the lesion. Yeah, but clearly, the gradual, the gradual expansion uh, in these cases is very advisable exactly for this reason. You, you don't want to go against a tight lesion all at once to the maximum point. You might as well do the very good, nice and gradual dilation. Right, so, so now, that, now that we've dilated, we had, and I just want to show you guys where we placed our filter. Again, maybe overkill, maybe not. The whole point is to try to, try to get this done easy. We're right in the distal pop with our Abbott filter there, which is again an off-label indication for this filter, but we did, we did, we did use it. Uh, the, the reason I use an Abbott filter versus an EB3 filter. You mean uh, this is a NAV, NAV6? The NAV6 filter. This is a NAV6 filter. Versus a uh, actual uh, spider filter is that is that the reason we chose that is because this filter allows us for the wire to move freely with this filter. So 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 here as we're going up with a bulky bi-bond covered stent, we clearly uh, have the ability to be able to uh, let the let the wire move with with the filter not having to move. Unlike with the EB3 spider, the, the, the filter may move along with the wire. So there are certain advantages to everything that you do. So now we've prepared the lesion. Now we've uh, we've we've gone ahead and uh, you know obviously uh, protected our, our 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 leg. We're on the appropriate anticoagulation. And now I'm going to throw out the million dollar question to you and Dr. Wiley uh, as far as what what size stand and what length stand. I gave you the IVIS measurements, I gave you the CT measurements, and you saw that she had balloon pain with the 7-0 balloon. So I'm curious, uh, I've got my mind uh, in certain area. I'm curious on advice from you guys since I have the two of you guys here. So I think I would use a 8-0, uh, uh, longer uh, size of uh, Viabon, perhaps from the uh, proximal uh, SFA that measures 7.5 down to the uh, uh, portion of the SFA that also measures somewhere between 7.5, 7.6 that we had met measured. You don't want to deploy the, the uh, distal portion of the stent at the area where it measures uh, uh, 8 or 8.5 millimeters because you're going to have a leak. And the purpose of all this is to seal or exclude that aneurysm. George, yourself? Yeah, I think the size 8 uh, seems to be a good one. This is the proximal seal that I think is very important to size it to at least seal one of the two for sure. And the very important seal is always a proximal. So you got to seal it off with an 8. And then the length, um, I think if you chew, if you go down to about uh, over 10, 10, 10 um, in length, that would be great because, uh, you know, this is going to clearly bring you to the uh, uh, third uh, of, the, of the SFA to the more normal segment, as you said. Well, again, you know, I want to thank Dr. Sands because we measured from the distal aneurysm um, all the way out to the segment where, where our, um, our SFA becomes a reasonable length. And yesterday, he measured that around 90 to, uh, to 100. There were areas, like I said, where it was a little higher, a little lower, but it was around 90 to 100. And then you figure if you add another 20 for the aneurysm itself and, this, and the stenosis, you're talking about a 120 millimeter length of Iobon that you're going to need. Now, I have a question for the two of you, and I'm just curious on your thoughts. If you look at a, a 8 -0, why an 8 -0 over a 7 -0 when the patient had pain with a 7? 7 balloon. And, and you have an IVIS measurement that says a little bit higher, a CT measurement, which I think I tend to believe CT a little bit more here because we have a lot of experience with CT with aneurysms, George, and you know that. And we have a lot of history with CT with aneurysm. It's very accurate in terms of our measurements. So the question is, I know Dr. Sands measured it very closely yesterday, 7.2, 7.3, yeah. 7.1. So, so my, my question here is, in far as you guys, you guys want to go with an 8. And I'm wondering, is it because the principle here, George, is to size it up by 1, or is it to go 1 to 1? That's my question. Yeah, you need to size it a little bit over the, the, the proximal. So if it's, it's already 7.5, 7.3, you know, a 7 might not seal that well. Right. Whereas an 8 will seal for sure. And in my mind, you know, it's okay if you want to do post dilations or adding things, whatever you want to do distally. But uh, it, this is very close to the ostium. You got to really get the proximal seal excellent from the get-go so then you can focus on the rest. I think, I think that's, the, that's the point. And I think George hit it, the nail on the head. 
said, is that the proximal seal is, uh, for everybody out there listening, the proximal seal is the most important thing. You know, yes, uh, as he was saying, we could always build the building below. We can't build it above, you know. You, you clearly want to be able to get one-to-one -one seal, exclude off the pro flow proximally, and you want to balloon it so this way you can and make sure that the bio bond is completely opposed proximally. Dr. Sands himself measured around 7.2, 7.3. Ibis has given us around 7.4, 7.5. Very close, but clearly larger than 7. Yes, he had to get pain with the, with the balloon, but here we know if we're going we're to do a covered stent, we can actually expand it bigger if we needed to. Second thing is the properties of the bio bond stent itself is not going to allow you to open this any further than really an 8 millimeter or a 7 millimeter stent. You may be able to take it to 7.1, 7.2 if you're really aggressive with it, but clearly this is not a stent that's a self-expanding stent that's going to be able to expand and actually, you know, uh, adapt to the vessel size. So you'd, you'd like to be as as one-to-one -one or a little bit over one-to-one -one as possible. And and if you look at the uh, the actual package inserts for these stents, can you look at the eight French, what, what size, uh, what, uh, what size uh, vessels they recommend, you'll see that, that it, that'll be a little bit uh, larger than, than, the, than the particular particular one. It's okay, I mean, I, I read it yesterday. You know, Percati, the beauty of having all this uh, adjunctive me measurements is that even though he had eventual related uh, pain, at least you know the exact measurement of that vessel. Right. So yeah, that's why the CT is very important. By the way, we're getting quite a few questions here regarding what are the available sizes of Vibon stands in, uh, in length and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and diameter, uh, as well as how, to, how the stand needs to be prepped. So uh, okay. we can address those as the case progresses. Well, Ray's going to open the stand and start prepping it. I'm going to bring, bring it over to you and show you. You know, it's basically a straight flush. Uh, it, it has a, a actual so rope release, as I call it, so it's quite uh, stable and not moving. So the point here in deploying the stent is you want to have that, 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 that landing zone so you don't come across the profunda. And obviously when you go through this uh, sheath, you're going to lose pressure and you're going to lose the ability to be able to see that, that, that SFA profunda area. But once the stent starts to deploy, it does not move unless you physically pull it. Now, I mean, anything can happen, as we know, but, but hopefully this is not going to be an issue for us. So you can see here the rays just put of, of, of flushing the center lumen here to, to get it ready to go. And, and as the stent comes out, uh, we're going to start taking our shots before we load the stent. Because once we load the stent, it's not going to happen. Number two, you're going to have to have a patient who is extremely, extremely cooperative. The patient has to understand that this is a partnership in this particular procedure because this is very important that he does not move. It's going to help us to, to work together. As you know, we don't sedate our We don't put them to sleep. We sedate them. But clearly, this is important. I'm going to let him know. Sir, it's important in a few minutes not to move your leg, okay? Not to move your leg. So, so now we're going to go ahead and set up our picture. And uh, again, I, I told you, distally, like George has so eloquently said, it doesn't really matter. We can build our bridge if we need to. But right now, proximally is what I need to know. So what I'm going to do here is even mag up a little further. And what I'm going to do is really for demonstration purposes is do a floor of fade, and I'll take it out if I need to. This is one of those things where you want to be once and perfect. There's no going back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an excellent projection, actually. You can see the bifurcation very nicely. And, and that's exactly the point, George, as uh, Dr. Dengas says so well, is that you need to see that bifurcation, right? And you need to see that landing zone. Now, this is an 018 stent, Dr. Dangus. They come in both 018 and 035. And so I went with the 018 stent, obviously, because I'm going on an 014 wire, which makes a lot of sense for me, especially since I want to place it on a filter. Now, so as far as prepping for this stand, it was nothing more than just flushing the lumen, and then you just load it on the wire, and yep. um, that's it. And that's it, sir. It's an over-the-wire system. And wow. okay, the wire is out. I'm just going to place my finger here. I don't want to disrupt my image. Like I said, I, I, it really doesn't bother me if I have to do this three times to get it right, meaning before I deploy it, of course. So I am going to do this till we're all satisfied and we're all perfect. So the Viabon is going in. By the way, there is a double density up in, the, in the, uh, this bifurcation indicating that the, uh, uh, that, uh, the uh, Profunda takes off a little bit actually higher than than uh, exactly where they meet. But uh, you can pull it even even more proximal than this, I would say. Okay, so I mean, if you want, I actually have a pressure. I'm going to try to inject again. Like I said, I'm in no rush here. I'm going to go to a better view. 
And I want to really demonstrate that we can see it. Watch your knees, sir. Okay, I'm going to because go Because again, back. you want to give that. This is just a general comment. You want to give not only a good seal, but also you want to give a little bit more of a length uh, to the proximal seal. Right. Exactly. So this is even a better view. Yeah, so this is I'm better. Gonna... You, can, you can see that we can gain about a, a three or four millimeters back by this uh, maneuver. Right. So, so great. this is a little too far back here. And I want to, I don't know how this is showing. It's actually showing quite good. Let me repeat that road map. But again, this is an eighth. It's not a self-expanding, like a 12 self-expanding that's going to expand all the way into the profunda. This is going to just essentially stay where it is. So, um, let's take a picture. Okay. We're back to I, I, I would to say it's pretty close. So we're going to take a nice picture here. I would say it's pretty close because the stand comes right after the dot. The right. dot is clearly proximal, but the stand is about, a, I would say, I shouldn't say the stand, the graft is a little bit, uh, about a millimeter below the, um, below the, uh, the dot, and let alone that all the stand grafts tend to like jump forward a bit, which is in this case would be going distally. So remember, the other thing also you have to worry here is as the stand graft opens, um, and we have some of the folks from Gore here. So as the stent graft opens, you, you, you can tell that, you know, whether, whether the stent graft is going to adjust to that larger dilated segment proximally or not. So I think here our placement looks pretty reasonable, you know, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're going to go ahead and start to deploy it, but I'm going to do it on the roadmap, or, or, or I can even puff out. But once I start, there's really no going back here. So the most important thing is keeping my system straight. The roadmap. Okay. Inject. I am probably going to... I don't think we want to see much, but well, one yeah, try. A little less, a little less angulation, so yeah, we can see it better. Yeah, Dr. Wiley wants a little less angulation, which makes a little bit of sense here. Okay. Yeah, that should be okay. There you go. Okay, I'm probably going to go forward a little bit here. It's going to foreshorten a little anyhow. It's going to foreshorten, but I'll just make myself a little bit forward. Right there. Okay. Is everybody happy with this, guys? What does everybody think? I think it looks pretty good. System straight. I'm going to start to deploy. Can we show the deployment? Uh, the, yeah, exactly. There's a core there that he's pulling steadily and um, slowly. It can be a little bit faster, actually. But, you know, essentially, you just pull the cord out, and that's it. it the cord doesn't pull the graft or anything. Just, uh, um, you know, it's just a release mechanism. And this uh, thing is uh, then um, allowed to uh, expand in situ. In situ. And typically, the gold graphs, uh, stand graphs, uh, uh, um, uh, expand from middle to both uh, edges. And uh, you can see that it, uh, you know, um, uh, came a little bit in as usual. There it is. All right, good. Let's see here. All right, let's take, a, let's retrieve that and take a little picture. A little dot, buddy. Uh, you can take out the equipment. Oh, I'm pretty happy with that, guys. How does that look? So I, I think so it's barely over the lesion over the PK. You, you, uh, I mean. Uh, oh, we're clearly on the neck of the lesion, George. But we got the lesion, yeah. and we're into the proximal segment. Now, I don't anticipate this to slide forward in any way. Now, there's no reason for this to slide, and we can talk a little bit about that. But let, let me walk this out. Walk this out. And let's post dilate. And give us a seven-o balloon here. Mm-hmm. Now, this is not going to be like a stent graft that's going to migrate forward, you know? So I'm not, I'm not so concerned. We've got the proximal neck of the lesion. You know, yes, you'd like to be one or two cells even more forward, but I was obviously concerned about the profunda, and I think, I think we'll decide in a second.
Yeah, yeah, we can we can go to one last mag as well to just uh, um, just take a panoramic view of this uh, uh, stand graph just to see how long it is. Just yep. uh, uh, let for me, a second. Let me post dilate this this way again. Yep. We're getting close to time, so give me a, a 7.0 7 balloon here, guys, again. And let me just go up here with a 7, and I, and I want to re ivis it to make sure there's no infolding or anything like that. Um, you know, these, these stent graphs have been so well manufactured uh, in, the, in the newer era as compared to the older era, as you, guys, as you know very well, George. And I think here, you know, I'm not so worried like a, like a, a for proximal fixation, distal fixation, et cetera, et cetera. We know we are definitely one-to-one -one size distally, okay, because we know that we're, we're very, very long, so it's not going to move forward distally. And, and proximally, it's definitely across that, that stenosis onto, uh, onto the normal segment. And we can IVIS it to ensure that we got proximal one-to-one -one capture. Can I have the balloon, guys? Proximal one-to-one -one capture. So here we're going with the IVIS. We're and remember post dilate the, it, so and then we'll, we'll, we'll post-dilate it first, and then we're going to go with the IVIS. Okay. Now, Pete, what, what size is this? 708. Why do we need an 80? <coughs> I asked for a 20. Oh. Okay, anyway, forget it. So, okay, so, so it's okay, we'll go with an 80. So the, anyway, the bottom line is our, we'll our, our team everything. is thinking ahead. They want to post out like the whole uh, 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 stent graft. So here we can already see we have a good seal because we have no leakage, but we're still going to make sure that this is up nicely. And remember, you're always going to have this look of a neck. The reason you're going to have this look of a neck is you, you went from a 13 or 14 millimeter or even larger size aneurysm to an, a, to a, to an a, a area that was even less. So I'm just going to go up right here. Go up. So I'm not too worried about this. I know I have a great seal and I know I'm in the normal segment when I deployed it. So here... No, for sure we see all the, the, uh, the stenotic area. There's no question about that. I don't think that. there's any reason uh, as we come further up to have any now you can you can definitely dilate it, Jose. Yeah. Go to ten. You will feel this, okay? Down. So now you see that's very important uh, to everybody at home. You want to go ahead and open this up to make sure you go you you get that seal part properly. Go up again. We're gonna feel that one more time, my friend. To ten. Okay, down. Perfect. So we went ahead and did that. Now I'm just going to pan down and show you the length of our graph, George. It's 150 millimeters, like I said, right up to here to and all the way up distal. to here. Okay? So we went from normal to normal, okay? And uh, the only question is whether we go with a larger balloon, and I think I may go with an 8 millimeter balloon here. Give me an 802 balloon, guys. Go up here. Down. Okay, so I need more contrast Walk here. The this, uh, the the flavor. Let it come down. Yeah. It's, it's not come down. Yeah, I need more. Uh, oh, you can go negative and walk it out. Yeah. Still up? Yeah, of course. You guys didn't dilute the contrast on that one. So I think little things like dilution of contrast, things like that, will help speed up the case here. Now, people may argue I could have pulled back further and landed more in the normal zone, but I'm not really worried about migration. I was very worried about not being able to, uh, about, about losing my, my SFA Profunda if this thing jumped back further. But clear clearly, we've got this nailed, and now we'll be done in a second. Is it down? Yeah. It's going in. Okay. Just a short 802, please. Is it a, would you give me a reef or? Yeah. All right, so we're going up with an 802 reef. Because the Vibon is an 80 Vibon. You know, as long as we don't, we didn't land inside of the aneurysm, I'm happy with that. So. Well, I well, think the, <laughs> the rest is just semantics. Yeah, so I think we're good. You know, we got a seal. And, that's, and I think this is where Dr. Dangus's point of following this 
closely will tell you. I mean, you're not going to accept rail, please. You're not going to accept any, not railing. You're not going to accept any endo leaks or anything like because we have a filter down there. Endo leaks or things like that to uh, to deal with this kind of aneurysm. They go up here, guys. I don't know why you guys are opening me a reef when, I, when you can open me a Dorado, especially for a post still. Is there any reason why? Yeah, obviously the, uh, uh, the story here is that the two things you, you're watching for is recurrent stenosis well, and recurrent so aneurysm leaks. Six. And this is the ultrasound is very good What's that in... Uh, in um, is very, the ultrasound is very good in, um, in um, surveilling for both of those. And uh, as we can see here, this is a 10 balloon. Maybe you can keep the balloon there and you can give us a little bit of an injection with the balloon up. You're going to feel that, my friend. Yeah, you can see that uh, we have about a 5 millimeter additional length if there is any of those uh, issues in the future, this can be extended uh, about that. Ten. This is a 15 millimeter, this is a 20 millimeter balloon, and you can see this three quarters inside the graft, and yeah. still not occluding the uh, the uh, the profunda. So, so I think that is a good measure for the future. Any of those treatments, if needed, they're going to be kind of easy to do. So now I'm going to move it down into the graft and aggressively blew it. I was at 10 atmospheres there. Now I'm going to go to 12. We're at 12. We're at 12. Okay, down. So it's a, it's a semi-compliant balloon, uh, or a semi-postal balloon, whatever they want to call it. Sorry, my friend. Okay, walk this out now. Now get us the Ivis quick, guys. I will before I pull this out. Little test, right? Yeah, let, let's do an angiogram, perhaps in the lower mag, okay, well, so we can uh, we can see the entire graph. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the pain? In your groin? I apologize. So with these larger balloons, as you know, getting them in and out of even large sheets are very difficult. I've always been the biggest complainer that peripheral equipment is uh, so far behind our times that it's unfortunate, but this is what we all deal with. You know, in the coronaries, we are able to send things through collaterals, through grafts, through et cetera, et cetera. For whatever reason, a peripheral balloon ha is, is a truck. So that's what we're dealing with here. A truck, that's a good description. <laughs> I wish I, I could coin that, George. It's been used multiple times before me, as you know. So, all right, ready? DSA guys, just a shot here. We're gonna do multiple views and prolonged DSA. Inject. So now what I'm doing, guys, I'm waiting, 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 waiting to see any filling of that aneurysm. There's no endo leak, right? There's no endo leak. There's, well, there's no filling that's of that so aneurysmal far. segment that I see anywhere. Okay. Yes, indeed. So that's a, that's a good seal that we have there. And we're going to do another view here, probably going to have to do AP. Yeah. We'll go a little bit longer here. And then before we go offline, guys, I want to just uh, show you a shot of the whole graft here. And Jack. Yeah, that's beautiful. See that? So now you've got, you know, a wonderful flow down, you know, um, and what we're going to do now is, I know we're a little short on time, is we're going to do a quick IVIS. Can I have an IVIS, please? So we're going to do a quick IVIS, and what we're looking for, why is this pressure so high, Lizzie? Problem from the pain. Are you having pain? Where? In here? That's the stretching. So we're going to look for an IVIS to make sure there's no invaginations of the graft. I really don't think the company recommends these kind of things anymore, right? In terms of invaginations of the graft, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, yeah, it expands very well. The older versions of this used, used to do it. So, you know, for, for our own knowledge and our own uh, teaching as we do this, these cases live to you, for you, we're just going to go ahead and show you the transition of the distal segment to the proximal. Show me distally, guys. Show me this Okay, so I'm going through the graft here, and I'm just distal to the graft. Okay, right there. All right, right. attach it on for me. Let me do the track back. So we're gonna do the track back for you. 
and we're just going to play you the transitions that so, we need to do. So this is about 7.8 uh, to, uh, to begin with, so the graph should be very well matched. This is an 8 millimeter graft and an 8 millimeter vessel, right, and so it matches very well. The transition is excellent and the graft is very circular as we can see here. Right, but, we're, but I, think, I think we're outside the graft here, George. Floor for me? It's, I think we're just on the border zone. Oh, it might be, it might be, you're right. Yeah, because I see some little... Yeah, you, I, I do see it. You're right. Yeah. So we're at the border. To go forward, forward a little bit. Oh, yeah, we already started coming back. All right, come back. Okay, recording. That's fine. So uh, you're right. So there you can see it's very well matched, very yep. well opposed, like George was so eloquently saying. And if you, if the viewers uh, focus also on the, uh, on the uh, uh, longitudinal view on the right, you can see the, the sequential dots that uh, correspond to the annual reserve, to the, to the stand graph struts. It's very characteristic on the longitudinal. And here again, you see the graph. There's, you know, imaginations as such. Uh, yeah, I don't really see anything that I'm concerned with here. And I don't even see a reason to dilate this with a balloon at this stage. Not at all. I think yeah. it's perfectly circular. Yeah, it's perfectly circular. And, uh, you know, so we're going to run it back. And, uh, you know, we just, like I said, you know, this is more for educational purposes. The angel graphically looked great. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, we, we had a really nice case here, George. It's one, the one hour has passed so quickly as always, right? And uh, we, we've discussed a few things. And I just want to take a moment to recap, of, uh, you know, for, for everybody what, what, what we talked about. So when we deal with these kind of difficult aneurysmal segments, um, and uh, I think the first important thing is, first of all, to, to find out what type of aneurysm is it. Is it a true aneurysm or a pseudo aneurysm? And that, a lot of that may be dependent on etiology, et cetera, and some Sometimes you may or may not have that history. So it's very important to involve, uh, get adjunctive imaging. Adjunctive imaging such as IVIS will, uh, I mean, such as ultrasounds will tell you whether it's a pseudo aneurysm. If it's a CT angel, the CT angel will also tell you, again, the same thing. It'll also tell you a lot of important information that Dr. Dengas outlined so clearly earlier. One, what, what, what is the neck of the aneurysm? What is the size of the aneurysm? What are, what are the adjacent structures that may be important to us or not important to us? And, 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 and three, it's, it's also whether or not that, that this is a case that we can handle endovascularly based on all those things that we talked about during the case. Now, before is to, is to uh, after, after we get the, uh, the, uh, the adjunctive imaging, what you want to do is involve your colleagues. Obviously, this is a multidisciplinary effort. You want to make sure that physiologically the patient needs the procedure done. Number two, it's also whether it's a surgical approach is more feasible versus an endovascular approach. Come to a consensus opinion based on what's best for our patient and then plan the case. Number one, what equipment that you need, what's your anticoagulation, what is the adjunctive imaging during the case, such as IVIS. As you see, we do a lot of peripheral IVIS, and you know, it's a most a coronary tool that a lot of people have been using for coronary and, and triple endographs, but we do a lot of peripheral IVIS to help us learn. And, 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 and finally, to have uh, great people like Dr. Dangus and uh, Dr. Wally to bounce it off, learn from, and then, and then work together. So, so basically, we're pretty much done here. You can see that the IVIS looks pretty good, okay? This is the neck right there, and there's the transition zone, and you see you have a perfect seal. And, uh, you know, George, any last thoughts before you no, start? No, that's it. I think you can see the pro most proximal SFA. That was an Thank excellent you. opposition. <laughs> I think this was a great case, PK, uh, Jose. Everyone in the in the room, um, uh, thank you very much for an outstanding uh, of an outstanding uh, um, um, uh, live case transmission. It was a very unusual and very challenging case that included um, a lot of imaging, uh, a lot of adjunctive technologies, a lot of communication and planning before the procedure. And I think that is uh, what uh, I need to stress for um, for the endovascular cases: the planning, the measurements, and the imaging above the procedure and the communication with a specialist in imaging associates as well as the vascular surgeons is very, very important into a case selection and swift case execution for excellent results. Let me remind everyone before concluding that we have the coronary um, structural and vascular cases symposium on June 11 to 14 here at Mount Sinai on campus at the medical center. You can register for it at, at cccsymposium.org, cccsymposium.org. And we'll see you again for a, a live webcast uh, right here at www.peripheralinterventions.org website at the, on the fourth uh, Wednesday of June again, and uh, until then, uh, so long from New York.